I want to say year, year and a half, God has really just been stirring my heart with gratitude. And, and there's just been uh, just kind of a, a, an overwhelming that I've kind of felt in my gut. You know what I'm talking about? When you just feel something down in your gut and there's just been a stirring in my heart that can only, that can only be described and only muttered as thank you. And I, I've just, I've gotten to this place where I'm waking up in the mornings and I'm, I'm just, that's the first thing that's coming out of my mouth. I just kind of say it under my breath a little bit. I'm just like, thank you. Thank you, God, for today. I thank you for what you're going to do uh, today, throughout the day. And it's not long. It's just, it's just something that I've, that I've started doing. It's just kind of a response to the goodness of God. I've noticed it when I've been going to bed at night. That's, I'm trying to make sure that that's the last thing that I'm saying, that I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. I thank you for today. It wasn't, it wasn't a perfect day. It wasn't great. But, but Lord, you still love me, and I'm still breathing, and my family's okay. And, and I'm just I'm thinking about all these things. I'm just so grateful for all that God's done. I'm grateful that you're here today. I'm grateful that we have a, have a church family where babies are being born, and they're, they're kind of like community babies around here. When a baby's born, it's like it's being passed around. And I'm grateful that my, I have a phenomenal, good-looking wife, you know, that I can wake up in the morning next to. And I'm grateful that I have amazing children. Man, I'm just so grateful for all that God has done in my, my life. And I'm also grateful for what God is doing in your life. And, you know, one of the things that I'm grateful about is that God wants me healthy. Did you know that God wants you healthy? Um, you know, when we look at the apostles, these were men that spent time with Jesus. And there's one apostle in particular, really probably my favorite apostle, is the apostle John. Now, John was the guy that said, hey, Jesus, can would you allow me to just come and let me set my head on your chest? And Jesus allowed him to do that. And I believe when he did that, I believe that he heard the heart of Jesus. So whenever he writes this in 3 John chapter 1, he said, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So I believe that he was praying the will of God. He was praying, man, God, I pray that, that the church, that they would prosper in all things. Now, we, we know that prosperity gets a bad rap, but how many know that prosperity is a good thing? That God wants you to have, that mean, prosperity just simply means this, that you have more than enough. That you have more than enough. It doesn't necessarily mean that you fly a jet or, you know, you have a hot tub in your limo. Um, if God wants to do that, that's awesome. But but you understand that you are well off, that you, that you have more than enough. And so he's saying this is that we may prosper in all things. Come on, in all things, in all, at your job that you're prospering, that you're doing well, in your family life, that you're not just getting by, that you're, that you're thriving, that your, your marriage is thriving, that your, that your children are thriving, that they're making good grades. He's, he's praying that we would prosper in all things and that we would be in health. I mean, that God wants you healthy and not just physical health, but God wants you to be mentally healthy. God wants you to be emotionally healthy. And then he says this, even as your soul prospers. So he's praying that, it, that, that our, our body, come on, and our, and our lifestyle would reflect what's happening in our soul, even as our soul prospers. So we know that, that God wants us healthy. And talking about the spirit of thankfulness, understand this, that the spirit of thankfulness is a pre prerequisite to a healthy soul. You can't be healthy. Listen, you can't be healthy and not be grateful. In fact, if you don't have gratefulness in your life, if you don't have a spirit of thankfulness in your life, you will not be healthy. And some of you, and this isn't a rebuke, and today's going to feel a little firm at times. It's going to be very encouraging at times. But listen, listen, some of you are unhealthy emotionally just simply because you don't have a grateful heart. Just simply because you don't have a grateful heart. Uh, it's been said that, it, that it's not happy people that are thankful. It's thankful people who are happy. And you know, I've found that to be true with people that I know, that, that, that it's not the people that have the most that are the happiest. It's the people are, that are grateful for what they have, whether they have a lot or they have a little. The, the, the fact is, is their state of being. And whenever they can be people that are content and they can be glad with, with what is happening and they can, they can give glory to God, those are the people that are the most happy. So gratitude is powerful. It's incredibly powerful. In fact, I, I think it's highly underrated as far as the postures in which we live in. Anne Frank said this about gratitude. Y'all know Anne Frank. Um, she said this. She said, dead people receive more flowers than the living because regret is stronger than gratitude. I heard that this week, and I was like, man, that is intense. That is heavy. But I believe that gratitude is more powerful. However, it depends on what we yield to. Do you yield to regret or do you yield to gratitude? Because regret is powerful. We know that. It is strong. 
But gratitude is more powerful if we will yield to gratitude. In, in the 80s, they had, a, they had a commercial, like during the Just Say No campaign, and some of you guys remember this, and there was a picture of a, you know, they put the camera shot on the frying pan, and there's this guy standing there who goes, this is your brain. Well, actually, I think he holds the egg or whatever, and he says, this is your brain on drugs, right? I mean, I've seen that, and it's the egg is frying. He's like, this is what it looks like. Listen, this is your brain on gratitude. Let's talk about your brain on gratitude. Um, there's a lot of neuroscience that happens. Ne- neuroscience and neural pathways are basically the way that your brain fires. It's the way it connect- connects. You guys remember, you've seen, uh, pr- probably none of us remember, but you've seen the way that they used to have uh, – telephone operators. Before cell phones, they had these things on a wall. It was called a phone. It had like a cord on it. And way before you could just punch in a number, there was just one number on there. And when you got on that phone, you called in and there was a lady or a man. In the pictures, you always see a lady. It was probably a man sometimes. And they were called an operator. And so you would you would pick up that phone and they'd be like, operator. And they'd be like, yeah, connect me to something. I don't know exactly how it worked, but I've seen the pictures. And what they would do is they would have all these little connections, right? All these little quarter inch jacks. And they would look through this wall and they'd be like, all right, you're number 11. So they would take a cord and they would connect that person to that connector. That's the way neural pathways are. They're, they're different pathways that are in our brain that connect the different parts. And you kind of have, you have like three parts in your brain. We did a series on this a couple of years ago. You have, you have three parts in your brain, right? You have, you have your instinctive brain, right? You just, you know, you have instincts to survive and fear and anger, all that kind of stuff comes from your instincts. And then you have like your emotional brain, right? Some of y'all have a bigger emotional brain than others. And then you have your your cerebral cortex, I believe is what it's called, the, the frontal cortex, I'm sorry. And that is your logical brain. And that's where you think about things and you process things. And humans, out of all all the, the, the living species on the earth, humans have the largest part of their brain that reason comes from, logic, right? And then we have emotions. Now, part of the problem in the culture that we live in is people don't use logic. They use emotion and instinct to do everything. Come on. And so what we need to do is we need to use our our brain. When we talk about using your brain, what we're talking about is that you would do things rationally and you would think about things. So neural pathways are the way that all those things are connected. And what neuroscience has shown us is confirms a lot about what we read in the Word of God, that gratefulness impacts the way that your brain fires, the way that the front of your brain communicates to the center of your brain, the way that your emotions work. Most people are like, well, I don't feel like being thankful, right? Or it's not my instinct to be thankful. I'm not, that's not the way I'm wired, right? I'm a half empty kind of person. But did you know that gratefulness will give you the authority to actually rewire your brain? If you want to be more grateful, you just got to be more grateful. And as you do that, it'll become more of an instinct. Come on, it'll become more of an emotion. But sometimes you just got to do the right thing because you know it's the right thing to do. And when you do the right thing, then you feel like doing the right thing. Then it becomes the instinct and you do the right thing automatically. But none of us are born doing the right thing. I mean, you think like when you're three years old and you're telling your parents no, and you're lying. Why? Because that's your instinct. That's your sinful nature, right? However, when we come to Christ, we have the ability to read the Word of God. We have the ability to be transformed in our mind through the washing of the Word, and we are able to rewire, come on, rewire even the way that we feel about things. You feed the way you feel. Did you know that? And so neuroscience has shown us, and you can go and look. I I don't have a lot of the stats today and all the sources because there are literally thousands of studies that have been done on gratefulness and how it impacts the brain. Did you know that gratefulness on some of these studies, not only does it just change the pathways and the unseen thing and the psyche of your brain, actually physical things change in your brain. Your brain looks physically, a thankful person looks, their brain looks different than a person that's ungrateful. So, pra- so practicing gratitude will re- rewire your brain. So the way our brain in is, wi- is, the way it's wired is not only genetic, it's developmental. Understand that. So you don't, we, none of us get the pass. Well, that's the way I am. I'm just kind of a negative, skeptical person. Me too. But guess what? I'm learning to rewire my brain because it's developmental. It's not just genetic. I am not a victim of the way I was born. Come on, God has given me the power to overcome some of my weakness. So there's actually long-term improvements to the activity of our brain. You got to think of gratitude as like a muscle, right? So the more that you work it, the stronger it gets. Are you tracking with me? And so you have a gratitude muscle. So work that muscle. Um, 
they found in these studies that people are more motivated. People that are grateful are more motivated. They're happier. They're less stressed. They're less anxious. It reduces depression. It improves sleep. Actually, physically, physical health is tied to a spirit of gratefulness of people just expressing gratitude. They're more resilient to trauma, more resilient to stressful events. And it reduces social comparison, which, we, which is a huge issue in, in the age that we live in. Comparison is a huge issue, but people that are grateful don't deal with that so much. They're not looking at what everybody else has. They're looking at what they got and they go, you know what, I got pretty good. Sometimes, sometimes it's the opposite. You see what people post and you're like, oh man, I do got it good, right? And so practicing gratitude actually has power. So God, who wants what's best for us, wants the best for us, wills for us. It's his will that you function with a grateful spirit. It's the will of God that you be like that. Many people are like this. Well, when the will of God happens, then I'll be grateful. Have you ever been there? I remember I was like that in my early 20s. Man, whenever I'm fulfilling the will of God, when I'm doing exactly what I have in my mind that God wants me to do, then I'll be thankful. I didn't say it, but I thought it. Have you been there? Have you been there? But listen, many people think I will be thankful when the will of God happens. No, 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 no. It's the will of God that you are thankful now. Check it out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Always be joyful. Now that's an encouragement, right? But it's also a command. How often are you to be joyful? Always. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So that's for you. It's for you to always be joyful. Then he, then he gives what I believe is the key. Never stop praying. Never stop praying or pray without ceasing. Some people say, well, that just means don't cease to pray. No, no, no. It means pray without ceasing. It means always be prayer, prayerful. Does that mean that you're always in, come to the church all the time and you're here praying? No, 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 no. Or by your bedside praying? No, no, no. It just means that you have, a, you are praying in the spirit all the time. When you're driving down the road, you're praying. Come on, you have your time, but you also have a posture of prayer in your life. So always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances. How many? All, all circumstances. What about when it's not a good circumstance? Be thankful in that circumstance. For this, mm -hmm. you want to know the will of God? Here you go. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. See, it's God will, God's will for you that you're always joyful. It's God's will for you that you never stop praying. And it's God's will for, for you that you are thankful in all circumstances. All circumstances. You have a flat tire on the way to church. Man, I'm going to church. God, you really let me have a flat tire. Right? That's how we get. It's so weird how we get like that. How about instead your posture should be like, man, this stinks. I got a flat tire. But Lord, I thank you that I have a car. I can have a flat tire. I thank you that everybody's safe, that somebody didn't run me over when I was changing that tire. Will you learn to be thankful in all circumstances? I love what Bill Johnson says is he says, we don't rejoice because we have joy. We have joy because we rejoice. And so some of you just need to work your rejoicing, grateful muscle. John chapter 17. Love this story. We're talking this morning about never forgetting. Everybody say never forget. Say this, we will never forget. We will never forget. Luke chapter 17, as Jesus continued towards Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. So here he is on the border. Galilee's full of Jews. Samaria is full of Samaritans. And as he entered a village there, 10 lepers stood at a distance. Everybody say 10. Crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Everybody say cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, Praise God! fell on the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now, the man was already cleansed from his leprosy. Jesus had more for him. I want to talk for a moment about lepers. Now, you got to understand, we don't really... We don't live in a culture that has a lot of leprosy. There's, there's very few uh, people in 
that have leprosy nowadays because of modern medicine. But, but in those days, leprosy was a, a serious, serious, serious condition. In fact, it was so serious and it was, it was thought of to be so contagious that if you had leprosy, in fact, any kind of skin irritation sometimes it could be considered leprous. And so they just, man, if, if it even smelled like, if, if it even pot could potentially be leprosy, they, what they would do is they would take these guys and they would cast them out of the city. Okay, they were outcasts. So they would send them outside of the city. And outside of the city, there were all these colonies of people that lived out there that were that were lepers. And so if you were a leper, you lived, you got to have some fellowship. So you just hung out with other lepers. And then so the hope with a leper is that he would get healed because, man, leprosy would spread like crazy. It would overtake your body. You'd be scratching all the time. It, uh, in intense cases, it would affect nerve endings and things like that. People's fingers could fall off and they could lose uh, limbs and things like that. It could actually kill you. There's been people that have died of leprosy. So leprosy was a big deal and they didn't have sterile environments to deal with it. So they just sent them outside of the city. And one of the things that you had to do in order to, to be cured of leprosy, once the leprosy left or you got cured or somebody like Jesus comes and heals you, then what happens is that you would have to go to the priest. The priest kind of functioned as uh, kind of the, the lawgivers and the ones that gave permission of those days. You would have to go to the priest and he'd have to say, okay, you're clean. Because one of the things that a leper would have to do because it was so contagious is that they would stay outside the city because they were outcasts. And if anybody that didn't have leprosy got close to them, they'd have to go unclean. They'd have to declare their identity that they were a leper. Isn't that sad? They'd have to say, don't come over here. I'm not fit for your company. I'm unclean. So these 10 lepers are out there and they say, Jesus, we've heard the rumors. We heard that you heal people like us. And Jesus is like, yeah, go show yourself to the priest. That's why he said that. Go show yourself to the priest. You're, and it said that they were cleansed along the way. However, after they all go to show themselves to the priest, they get their paperwork saying, hey, we're good, man. We got the bill of clean health. Only one came back to Jesus. That's savage. What is up with that? Nine guys that got healed didn't go back to Jesus. And the one did. And Jesus was troubled by the spirit of the nine. So we see that uh, Jesus, one thing that he does is he connects with the outcast. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad when you were unfit for his company that he, that he spoke the word over you, that he spoke the word? He, he, he did the deed to make you clean. Then he extends mercy. They asked for mercy, he gave it, because that's what he does. But the other thing that we see about Jesus is that he was troubled by ungratefulness. Did not heal ten men. Where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Why are people so ungrateful? You know, one of the great bondages of the generation that we live in is entitlement. It's one of the great bondages. We don't, we don't, we kind of just kind of gloss it over and make jokes, but listen, entitlement is a bondage because it, 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 it robs you from the joy of being grateful. Uh, the entitled, listen, the entitled demand an experience, but the grateful are driven to expressions of gratitude. See, many will experience his power, but only the grateful will express praise. This is what we see that this man that comes back to Jesus. Maybe they, they felt entitled because they were Jews. And they were like, well, we're God's chosen people. right? Maybe they felt entitled because of that. But listen, just because, just because you're chosen doesn't mean you're in. Right? Just because you got the ticket, just because someone gave you the airplane ticket, doesn't mean you're flying anywhere. You got to take that ticket. You got to appropriate that ticket. Take that up to the ticket counter. Go stand in the line. Go through the checks. Go in and get. You got to get on the plane. It isn't enough just to be chosen to be given a ticket. You got to get on the plane. And so these guys got the ticket. Come on, they got cleansed, but they didn't get in the plane. They were entitled. They thought they deserved it. Listen, what you deserve is justice. That's what you deserve. I mean, let's just let's just be real. I mean, you are comparing 
we, we, we use this word called good. People are generally good. Scripture tells us this, the opposite. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says there's none good, no, not even one. Because good is really a term that, that we use to appropriate to God. God is good. And so what we do, what we've done in our culture is by calling everybody generally good is what we've done is not, we haven't really elevated people. We've just lowered our view of God. We said he's not really good. He's not really holy. So see, what you deserve, we call that justice. So you don't really, you don't really deserve anything really good. What you deserve is called justice. But listen, beloved, God has far more for you than you can ever earn or ever deserve. Far more. So why would you be entitled to what you have? Because God has so much more for you. God has so much more. Why would you be so entitled to what you have? Because God has so much more for you than what you have. God has so much more for you than what you can earn. So much more. So much more than what you deserve. We call that grace. So you can't earn grace. You just trust it. Grace, grace isn't earned. Come on. It's not deserved. It's trusted. You can't earn grace. And what he's brought to us is grace. So don't, don't feel entitled. That'll rob you of your gratitude. Maybe they were situationally minded. Maybe they thought, well... Jesus healed me. I don't need to go back to Jesus. I don't need to give him any thanks. I'm out of that situation now. And many times in our lives, we go, I don't have anything to be grateful for. I'm not at the job I like. I'm not in the marriage I like. I, my kids aren't behaving the way I think they should behave. And so we read that and we go, be thankful in all circumstances. You don't live my life. You don't know. You've never walked on my shit, right? Get all negative. Are you situationally minded? Let's look, let's look at back at this scripture. It says, be thankful in all circumstances. Now, it doesn't say be thankful for all circumstances. Come on. I'm not thankful that my boss and I are banging heads. And I'm not thankful for the situation, but I'm thankful that I have a job. I mean, you could be on welfare. And if you were on welfare, then you could be glad that you can be on that for a little while until you can get a job. Come on, are you with me? So there's always a reason to be grateful. So we're called to be grateful in all circumstances. Not just when it's going good, even when it's going bad. I can still have joy. I can still be thankful. God still knows my name. I'm still his son. I'm still forgiven. That hasn't changed. There's always a reason to be grateful. So maybe they felt entitled. Maybe they were situationally minded. Maybe you're situationally minded. Or maybe they just forgot. Maybe they forgot. I mean, maybe they thought the priest healed them. Or, but one thing that we do know about this Samaritan is he didn't forget. See, Samaritans of that day were considered to be incredibly and particularly wicked. The Jew, They were outcasts of the Jews. They, they didn't even have to have leprosy to be jacked up. They were. They started off in the wrong camp. They already had like five strikes against them, right? Because they were Samaritans. So he knew that he wasn't awesome God deserving. So he was the only one who went back. Maybe the others forgot. You know, I've known a lot. I, I've, I've been doing this for a little while. And, I, and I've, I've seen a lot of people forget. I've seen people forget what God's done in their life. I'll see people, man, I've seen people come in to Jesus, get forgiven, right? Their situation changes. Come on, their life changes in a moment. Everything, God just does a work in their life. They're, man, I've never experienced something. Two weeks later, I'm like, where'd they go? Where'd they go? Did they forget? Beloved, have you forgot? Have you forgot? Have you forgot what Jesus did for you? Have you forgot what he's done? You know, I, I see people come in and they're like, I'm all in for God. I'm all in. All compromise is gone. I'm sold out to Jesus. I'm going to tell people about Jesus, right? I'm going to tithe. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm all in. I'm going to serve. I'm going to do it all. And as soon as it starts getting a little bit difficult and things don't go the way I want it to go, then what happens is I kind of slip back a little bit and go, well, I'll take that back, Jesus. 
Well, that, my time is important to me, Jesus. I'll take this back and I'll take that back. All of a sudden, we're not all in anymore. Why? Because we forgot. Beloved, don't forget where you came from. See, I can't, I can't get over the fact that when I was 18 years old, Jesus broke into my life, into my broken, jacked up, purposeless life. It's a son, I want you. I wanted you so much that I paid the very highest price I could possibly pay because I want you. I want to be in relationship with you. And he pulled me out. Listen, I was on my way to hell fast. And Jesus said, I want you with me. I want you in connection with me. I want you in relationship with me. And it wasn't because I did anything. It's because he did. And I will never get over the fact that Jesus rescued my life when I was 18 years old. I'll never get over it. I can't get over it. I've been, I, I haven't tried to get over it, but, but I, I, for 25 years, for most of my life, I can't get over it. I can't get over that God loves me. I mean, I'm thinking like, how could a God like that love a man like me in all my insecurities and in all my brokenness and all my messed up wiring of my brain? All the things I've, I've done in my life, all the poor choices I've made, even after I came to Jesus, I can't get over the fact that he loves me. And so I'm not perfect, but I am grateful. And he ain't giving up on me. Beloved, don't give up on him. Don't forget. Don't forget. It's, 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 it's almost like people get used to Jesus. So they get used to him. They come in, they're like, God, I'm so tired. I'm reading the word, praying, serving their guts out. I'll do anything for you, God. Did you forget? Did you forget? Have you got used to Jesus? You know, leprosy is symbolic of sin. Throughout scripture. The reason why leprosy is talked about so much is because it represents sin. Sin, sin has, a, has a destructive uh, form to it. it. Leprosy has a destructive form to it. It spreads. It eats away at your life. And sin does that. Sin eats away at your life. It eats away at your conscience. Come on. It eats away at you. Beloved, have you forgotten a couple of things? First of all, all have sinned. We've talked about that a little bit. All, all have sinned. Not just me, you too. <laughs> I'm glad you're saved. I don't like to know you. No. But all, all of us. All of us in sin. It says this, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. It's not that, that, that we're wicked compared to the guy next to us, but the, the comparison isn't to the guy next to us. The comparison is Jesus. The comparison is the righteousness of God that only can be attained through Jesus. Have you forgotten that all have sinned? Have you forgotten that the wages of that sin is death, which means eternal separation from God? Eternal separation from God. Have you, have you forgot that you were an enemy of God? I, I, I never really saw myself as God's enemy, but according to God, according to God's word, it says that I was an enemy of God. It says right here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, you who were once far away from God, you were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten that without Jesus Christ, you're an enemy of God? That's scary. However, <laughs> come on, however, however, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. The gift. Jesus is the gift. The gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is righteousness of the righteousness, the rightness, the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. See, you can go to heaven and stand before God when you die with your righteousness and with your deeds or with Jesus's. I think I'll pick his. Because that's the righteousness it takes to get in. So, he's handing out tickets. Don't die with the ticket in your pocket. Jesus paid the wage. 
So it says we were enemies, we were separated, we were messed up by our actions. It said, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. Just like he did that leper, he brought him into his presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. It's good news today. But have you forgotten? Have you forgotten that Jesus paid the wage? Have you lost gratitude that Jesus took, died a sinner's death? That Jesus died like a criminal? Jesus. Jesus. God in the flesh. It's not like another good dude died for you. This is Jesus. God in the flesh took stripes upon his back, took whippings, lashings upon his back that could easily kill a man could potentially cause organs to fall outside of his body. Have you forgotten that Jesus hung on a cross, bleeding, dying, suffocating on a cross? We created a word for it. It's called excruciating. That he paid that price. Why? Because that's the price that you were worth. You were worth it. Because it speaks of your value. It doesn't just speak of your sin. He didn't die just because of your sin. He died because you're valuable. And so Jesus died for you because he wanted you. Never get over the cross. Never get over the cross. Never get over the fact that the God that created the universe, Jesus, who's in on creation, says, you want him, Father? Do we want him? I'll deal with the sin issue. I'll show them how valuable they are. I'll go. And then he defeated death. Don't forget. So he doesn't just cleanse us from leprosy. And I love the cross. I love forgiveness. But he has more. There's a resurrection in him. There's a new life in him. See, the, 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 other, the other nine, they didn't get to experience the resurrection life. They didn't experience it. See, Jesus had more for the other nine, but they were satisfied with just getting their momentary fix. See, there will be some things that you will never receive because you are ungrateful for what you have. Some of you, you will not receive the things that you would like to have just because you don't exercise gratefulness in what you have. And it's not just, listen, we don't express gratitude just because he's worthy. He built this in. He knew how we were wired, and he said, you know what? I want you to learn to be grateful because it's going to transform you. It's not just because I'm worthy and all that. That's great. Yes, absolutely he is. But listen, he did, it's not a command that you don't benefit from. Trust me, you benefit out of praising God a lot more than he does. So Jesus says to this man who shows up, Jesus is deeply troubled. He's like, I just, I have more to give these guys. Where are they at? He said, stand up. Your faith has healed you. So he was clean, but now he's healed. See, what's the difference? That word healed there is the word sozo. And the word sozo means this. It means total package. It means physical healing. It means emotional healing. It means mental healing. It means restoration with God. It means everything that Jesus paid for is made manifest in your body. Manifest in your mind, manifest in your soul, all of it. So gratefulness increases our faith as well. So you I need to have more faith. Be more grateful. Why, why, how does it increase your faith? Because, the, because we keep the one who trusts who we trust before us. So that's why. It's like, how many, you have more faith. When we come together, we worship, and you're like, you're like ooh, you can have faith for anything. Right? I mean, when I'm having like a moment with God, and I'm like, you can do anything, right? <laughs> I'll pray for anything in that moment. The problem is we leave the moment. The problem is we don't have those moments throughout the day. The problem is we might have that moment once a week, once a month, once every six weeks, something like that. Listen, but gratefulness, listen, gratefulness increases our faith because we keep the one we trust before us. So he came back to Jesus. He's like, I, here I am. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know. Let me give you some more. So three things, we're closing up today. Three things, three ways to start your gratitude journey. One is you just say it. 
we'll, we'll recap these things all throughout the series. The first thing is you just say it. You say, you know what? God, I'm so grateful. Would you wake up every day and just let the first words that come out of your mouth. You know, you don't have to be loud. You don't have to dance around the room. You might not be cool. I'd love that. I'm on a video. But just wake up. And this is what I do every day. I just wake up and I go, thank you, God. You don't even, you don't even, you don't even, have, to, you don't even have to get so specific and be that thoughtful. Just, just say it. Just say, thank you, God. When you enter into prayer, thank you, God. Come on, throughout your day, just thank you, God. When you go to bed and I just thank you, God. Say it, say it, say it, say thank you. You watch things begin to change. You know, thank you. I would say this, that, that the statement thank you is as strong as the statement I love you. Especially in this culture that we live in. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty, like, I'm, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I, I try to be really generous uh, to people in front of me. I try to open doors and be friendly and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and I don't do it to get any appreciation. I don't do it. I just do it because, uh, because I'm, I'm blessed, and I, I see myself as that way. So I, it doesn't cost me anything to do that. And so, come on, I can afford it. And so when I open the door for somebody, and they just kind of walk by, and they're like, you know, Todd, I'm like, it don't really bother me, but it, but it, but it, the, the reason why it bothers me is because I know that person is being robbed of the blessing of being grateful. Say thank you. Say thank you to God. Say thank you to people. Say thank you to your spouse. Well, that's your job. So, aren't you grateful that they do their job? Yeah, I am. Go tell the trash man on Friday morning. He's out there. Take, take some time. Thank you. That might ever transform his life. That someone's grateful that he's picking up your trash. That's a big deal. I paid him for it. So, would you do that job? Oh, oh. Number two, write it. So we have these thank you cards in the back seat uh, of your seat of the seat, the seat backs, not back seat, back seat backs. You can put it in your back seat if you want to. I wouldn't put it in your back seat. You'll forget about it. Put it in your front seat. But take that. I want you to take that card, and as we do this series, maybe stick it in your Bible if you use a paper Bible, or ladies, you can stick it in your purse, or guys, put it on your tool bench, because I know you're so manly, you're on your tool bench every night, and so pull, pull that card out, wherever it is, somewhere you can put it, maybe by your, by your bathroom counter, just take a moment, just take a moment, write down something you're grateful for, I'm thankful for Leslie Brown, right, I'm thankful for Jesus, I'm thankful for forgiveness, I'm thankful for mental health, I'm thankful for peace, I'm thankful for joy whatever it is that you're just thankful you're just thankful and just write that down and I, I think if you do this for these you know this six weeks that we're going to do this series i think you just begin to see things change and the third thing is just reflect reflect on just just hit the pause button of your life even if it's just for two or three minutes just hit pause and just utter those words thank you and just start thinking about the goodness of god that he rescued you that jesus saved you. We're going to pass out some communion elements this morning. We're going to do the, every every week for the series, we're going to take communion. And uh, I believe this. I believe that as, as we take communion every week, I think things are going to start changing in your life. Some of you have physical issues. I think some of you are going to get healed physically during this series just by remembering the price that Jesus paid. I think some of you that have been dealing with emotional battles for years, for decades, some of you, I believe that during this series, as you begin to practice gratitude, I, I think we're going to see some of that stuff fall off. I think things are going to change. We can go ahead and pass those out, guys. You know, when we take communion, the reason why we're taking that Jesus said this, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I did. Be grateful for what I did. So why do we take communion? We take communion because it's the... It, it, it's a way for us to remember that Jesus' Jesus body was broken. Thank, thank you, Vinny. Thank you so much. That Jesus' body was broken for us. That's why we take the bread. And then we remember the blood of the new covenant that says, you're forgiven, you can come, I have new life for you. Life is in the blood. Come on. So what I want to do is I want to just take just a moment. I want to read this, and then we're going to take the elements together. Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 26, is when they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat eat this because this is my body. This is my body that was broken for you, for your healing, for your restoration. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out 
for many for the forgiveness of sins. Without Jesus shedding his blood, you couldn't have been forgiven of your sin. But Jesus shed his blood so you could. And it's not just blood of forgiveness, it's also the blood of the new covenant, that there is new life in Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for sending Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful. I'm so thankful, Lord. I'm so thankful that your body was broken for me. Lord, that I could experience that sozo. I could experience that healing. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for Isaiah 54. That you were bruised for our transgressions. Your body was broken by your stripes. We are healed. Let's take the bread together. And Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed. For the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Lord, that there's new life. There's it's new life in you. We're so grateful. Thank you for pouring your blood for us. In the name of Jesus, let's take it together. Let's just stand up all across this room. If you need ministry this morning, if maybe today you need to, you need to get your life right with Jesus. I'm not going to go through all the indicators of that, but you know. You know, you've searched your heart and you say, you know what, Pastor Josh, I need to get right with Jesus. Then what I want you to do is just in just a moment when we pray, I just want you to come up and share that with the person that you're, uh, that is up here with you. Just share that with them and they'll, they'll walk you through a little simple prayer. Some of you need, you're right with God, but you have some things going on in your life. You have maybe mental issues or emotional issues, some of you physical issues. I believe the Lord wants to touch you today. So if you need ministry of any kind, you need prayer of any kind, we have this ministry team. And I'm going to read this scripture. And as I'm reading this, if you want to come up, you can. If not, if you're not getting ministry, just close your eyes and just let me read this verse over you. Ephesians chapter 1. You can come forward right now if you want to come forward. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. All praise to God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God. We praise him for this glorious grace that he's poured out on us, who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and in grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. We're so grateful, Lord.